Welcome. My name is Melissa Bailey Kirk, and I serve as the pastor at Gashland United Methodist Church in the Northland of Kansas City, Missouri. Over the past six weeks, we have been remembering the distinctive ways that God's good news emerged in a barn. We have been, I hope, reawakened to God's divine dream for all people, for all creation, peace and wholeness justice and mercy. In their telling of the events surrounding the inbreaking of God's dream, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke both affirm the birth of Christ as the beginning, the epiphany, the manifestation of the good news. As is true of all news stories, there's always another perspective, another way of looking at things, a different point of view. Take, for instance, the Gospel of Mark, which opens with these words, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we might expect that the next sentence would then describe the ways that Jesus was connected to the lineage of King David, or tell the story of a young girl, a carpenter, some shepherds, and a star. Mark's good news begins in a different place, is offered to us from a different point of view. Listen now to the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ from the Gospel of Mark, chapter one, beginning with verse four. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were coming out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. This is the same John that leapt in the womb of his mother Elizabeth when Mary came to visit, carrying Jesus in her own belly. John, Jesus's cousin, now an adult, baptizing Jews. Washing in water was a familiar religious practice to Jews gathered there at the Jordan River. Sacred scripture in Leviticus, called the faithful to ritual cleansing from impurities, for instance, when they had come in contact with a corpse, and priests were required to engage in specific ceremonies of cleansing, of washing, in order to be pure enough for their work in the world, which was to serve in the temple. On this day, however, in Mark, the day of the beginning of the good news, John called people to a new experience of washing, a baptism of repentance, of forgiveness. This was not a riverbank filled with priests ready to get cleaned up before their shift started. These were regular people, people like you, people like me. Moving from dry land into the water, allowing themselves to trust that the confession of their sins was heard by the God who created them, that the sensations, that the splashes did not only wash away those sins, but prepared them for their work in the world by realigning their hearts and minds with the heart and mind of God. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. As unique as John's practice of baptism was, it was nothing compared to the baptism that was to come with Jesus. And in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased much like the bright star that guided the steps of those magi, that heavenly light that distinguished one baby from all of the others. Much like that, here, God's spirit, like a dove, 
pointed the way to the sacred moment of baptism. And a grace-filled voice announces this act as unique, blessed, and desirable. Why? What's so special about baptism? Why, from Mark's perspective, is Jesus' baptism the start of the good news rather than Jesus' birth? Why, in Mark's gospel, does Jesus receive his divine name from God at the moment of his baptism? You are my son, my beloved. The significance of baptism runs deep through our faith journeys and far beneath the surface of today's reading from the Gospel of Mark. Christian tradition asserts that Jesus was without sin. That is to say, Jesus never voluntarily or willingly did anything in opposition of the goodness of God's way. Even so, he presented himself for baptism, a baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sin. And in the instant of the sinless son of God's baptism, the heavens opened up and the spirit of God, the word translated here, spirit also means breath. The spirit of God, the breath of God descended and the voice of God spoke grace, deep, deep grace and pleasure. Jesus, as he moved from dry land into the water, demonstrated for all that baptism is so much more than the washing away of sin. Baptism is a conversation between the creator and the created. In his baptism, Jesus spoke. Jesus spoke to God of faith and love and of his willingness to receive God's call to be, by the breath of God's spirit, to be faithful and loving. In his baptism, Jesus said yes to God's call to live as God's son. His face lifted up to God's anointing of him for the work that waited. In this baptismal conversation, Christ was not made immune to the pain that would come at him as he spoke divine truth to perverted power. His living out his life as God's beloved brought him suffering. Baptism did not eliminate hardship for Jesus, but it did prepare him for it. In baptism, through the Spirit of God, Jesus was given all that he needed to live as God's beloved, to live as, to be God's good news. As followers of Jesus, we celebrate the sacred moment of baptism because in doing so, we follow Jesus right into the water. Our experience as we are baptized is no different from that of Jesus all those years ago. There's no magical, sudden immunity to the tragedies of life, but we are prepared for all of life as we share in the mystery of holy conversation and communion with our creator. Like Jesus, we acknowledge in baptism that God has created each of us in love and in hope. Like Jesus, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the holy breath of God. Like Jesus, we are washed in God's pleasure and delight as we lift our hearts to the one who is the perfect parent. Simply put, Baptism unites God and human in remembrance of God's saving acts, in acceptance of God's grace, and in anticipation of spiritual growth. Remembering, accepting, anticipating. In baptism, God meets our human need for love and acceptance, reminding us that God has given God's self to us even before we know we need or want God. In baptism, God comes to us again in love and acceptance, caring for us, affirming our place in God's heart, welcoming us into the family, and preparing us for our work in the world. 
perhaps this is why Mark's gospel points to the baptism of Jesus as the beginning of the good news. Perhaps Mark's perspective went something like this. It's all well and good for the baby to be born, the angels to sing, the magi to follow that star. But the good news isn't really good news until everyone gets it. This week I've been thinking a lot about the relationship between baptism, good news, and political upheaval. I thought about Mark's point of view as I watched the news coverage of the rioting in Washington, D.C., the breaching of barriers, the assault on the Capitol building. I was struck by the irony, the deep irony of this bad news being enacted before all of our eyes on the day of the epiphany when followers of Jesus celebrate the appearance, the manifestation, the showing up of the essential nature of God in Jesus Christ, the manifestation of the good news. What would the writer of Mark's gospel say to us today? Would the writer sit with us as we watch the news and say, the good news isn't really good news until everyone gets it. Would that writer point us back to the baptism of Jesus and say, the good news isn't the good news until we rise up out of the waters of baptism in conversation and communion with God and do the work that is waiting for us. This aching world of pandemic racism division, polarization, and violence is crying out to those of us who have been wet in the waters of baptism, crying out saying, we need some good news. When does the good news start? It starts when you and I rise up out of those waters and head back to dry land and be good news with our words and our actions, which is the work that is waiting for all of us. We won't all be good newsers in the same way, will we? Some of us will write letters, make phone calls. Others of us will deliver groceries or meals. Some of us will provide funds. Others of us will build things. Some of us will speak out. Others of us will hold prayer vigils. Some of us will preach. Others of us will teach. Some of us will challenge. Some of us will comfort. The ways that God's good news can be shared with others are infinite because the grace of God is not limited by our human limitations. How does God equip you? How does God gift you? How does God call you to be good news? to be good news for your family, for your neighborhood, for your church, for our country, for the world. It's hard work. It's hard work to be a voice, to be a presence of unity when we do not all agree. To be a voice of calm when our own heart rate increases with anger and anxiety to offer forgiveness to the other when we're not at all sure that the other wants it or that the other deserves it. To be good news when our news feeds are inundated with bad news. Being the good news brings pain, doesn't it? Friendships can be lost, relationships fractured, and feelings hurt. And while the conversation and communion of baptism won't do anything to make the work of good newsing easier or eliminate the suffering that will surely come, it does prepare us for the unique ways that God is equipping, gifting, and calling each of us to do the work of the baptized. Maybe we've forgotten what it means to be baptized, or perhaps 
you've not been baptized and you're just learning what it means. It could be that our baptisms were never explained to us. I dare say that few of us, if any of us, watch the news or move through our days thinking, to what does my baptism call me in this moment, in this situation, in this relationship? To what does my baptism call me in this moment? Friends, what would happen if we did? What would happen if we moved through our days asking ourselves that question? To what does my baptism call me in this moment? May you allow the Spirit of God to wash over you in refreshing drops of grace. May you rise up dripping to be the good news of Jesus Christ in a hurting world. And may you breathe in the Spirit of God with every breath you take. Amen.